Welcome to Kuvulu, the sorcery of copper. So previously we saw that we can clone this remote for garage doors simply by recording the signal using a software defined radio and then we take an off-the-shelf remote where, which we wrote firmware for the big microcontroller here and then we can flash it to the computer and flash the specific code we want to send. So this is if I have the remote. What if I want to use the remote of let's say a neighbor or a friend of somebody uh, I would like to help um, in the general interest of everyone. I could still use this but this is quite impractical, uh, and particularly if you don't know where the other remote is, uh, if you cannot control, who knows why for. Uh, there is still a command in RTL is there where you don't have to exactly tune. Um, RTL FM, uh, in RTL FM where you don't have to exactly tune at the right frequency because my the AM decoding don't work don't work very well if you're not in the 100 kilohertz same same range. Um, you could uh, specify a range, uh, a squelch, and the, tu the tuner gate by hand. Here's the squelch level, here are the steps for the frequency range, this is the tune again, still AM, and then decode. And this helps a bit, so it has a wider range depending depending on, on the remotes, and it works. But the other problem is that to do that, you always need the computer on, and always software-defined radio. And my laptop has a battery which holds only 30 minutes. This is not practical if I want to snoop on lots of codes for one day long because I still want to use my laptop. It is working, but it's not—it's not, it's not very practical. Another thing you could do is just um, there are transmitters already, so why not look at the appropriate receiver for this transmitter? And again, if we go to the Linear Corp um, website and we look at the Mega Code Radio Control, yep, we have here the transmitters. Uh, mega code transmitters, um, and here we have receivers. You can see there's a wide choice of receivers uh, MDR for one ch uh, channel, MDR2 for two channels, MDRU, and so on. And if you look at Amazon uh, for mega code MDR, you will see the exact same product. You'll see the MDR, which is a linear mega code receiver for one channel. This is so this is powered by 24 volt, external 24 volts, and they are used to receive the code and switch on the motor for the garage gates. The same here for the MDRU, um, but instead of having 24 volts, it simply has, you simply plug it on AC. Here on the bottom, you plug whatever gate you want to trigger, and here it goes. I prefer to take, I prefer to take this one, because first it's cheaper, and we want to do cheap things, but also because it's not connected on mains, and working on mains is, is not very good. You, you have to be cautious, and if you're not cautious, you can fry things. This one, you just have to provide 24 volts. If we look on the side, we have one button to program the codes, and actually how it works is that when you press on the button, you then trigger the remote, and then the antenna receives the signal and will program the code inside. Now, every time the code is received again, it will trigger, it will accept the code, and when it accepts the code, it will trigger the gate. And the connections on the back are very simple. You have one time ground, one time 24 volt to provide the board with power, and in the middle you can connect the relay. So whenever this, the right signal which has been programmed in is received, it will just trigger the relay. You can program up to 10 codes on the one channel receiver and 12, uh, 20 codes on the two channel receiver, and that's mainly that's the, the biggest difference. If you look also at the back, you, you will find that it has 318 MHz, so it, it corresponds to the same one, Liga Corporation, model MDR, the part number, and here is again the FCC ID. As you can see, the FCC ID is always the same, EF4, seems to stand for Linear LLC, and then they use the parts number, which is similar to here, uh, probably this is just the one channel, they use this parts number for having the 
for using it in the FCC ID. So using this information, you can find out about the other project. And also, if you look at the FCC ID, you can still give parameters. You can say that I want every product which is from Linear LCC, which works on 318 megahertz. Then it will list all the projects which uh, Linear applied for. But um, this is not like a, like a remote control which sends any signal where you have to prove that you respect the regulations and show at which power you're sending. This one is only receiving. So they don't, don't have to send any measurements. And in this case, they also didn't provide any schematics and so on. So let's have a look inside. As you can see, the device is pretty simple. And what's most what's characteristic is that it's whole through hole components and that makes it very easy to tap on different devices since you can t touch the leads directly and the leads are very spacious um, and distance to, to one each other. It's also a single sided board. This even makes it very easy to read which pin is connected to which other pin. Uh, we can see big test points. Here is test point one, this is ground, test point two, this is actually five volts, and so on. This is the modification I already did. So it's very easy to figure out which, which component is connected to what. And here are the components. So um, this is the antenna, which goes through here. Here we have an LM333. Probably it's used, this time I is used as clock reference for having the 318 megahertz. Here we have an LM358, uh, this is an op amp and it's used to filter the signal so the microcontroller which is here gets uh, a clear code which you can then compare with the database. This is the crystal, 4 megahertz crystal for this microcontroller. And here we have an I2C EEPROM which will store the codes uh, which are accepted or not. So whenever a code which is received and then is present in the I2C EEPROM is received, then it will trigger the relay here. Um, here we have the power source with the, I think this one, yeah, PR. This one is the voltage regulator. This is the relay. And here we have just one switch, one infrared LED. And as you can see, we have some unpopulated components. Here you can put a second relay. Here you can put a second switch. And this is actually on the only difference between the MDR, um, simple MDR and the MDR2. The MDR2 is for two channels and two channels mean there's just a, a second uh, really. The software should be exactly the same. <clears throat> um, I've already modified the sport, but originally it came with a PIC16C54 and this is a one-time programmable chip. Also it had code protection and um, data protection, so I couldn't read neither the program which is inside nor the ROM which stores the code, but um, it's also hard to read the data which is in the EEPROM since they do not use EEPROM as it's intended, so the I2, so it speaks I2C protocol. In I2C you have, you need um, pull-up resistor on the 5 volt lines and then you use open collectors to just set the line to, to 0 volt. Uh, this one doesn't use uh, open collectors and also they don't have pull-up resistor except for the data line. The clock line is completely driven by the chip and it's uh, the and the I2C is a simple software bit banging. So because the board uses through hole components where which are very spacious and have connections on the bottom and because it's single sided so all the traces are on the bottom and you don't have any vias it's quite easy to figure out and to read from the PCB itself which component is which con it's connected to which other you can still use the continuity test of the multimeter uh, to be sure but it's not really required so what I did is just recreated part of the schematic to understand how it works. So the central microcontroller is a PIC 16 c 54 an EEPROM based, very cheap one-time programmable one. And then we can see that it controls two, um, two relays. These are the two relays it can control. The MDR, which I have, has only one channel, so it controls only one relay. It also has only one switch. The MDR2 has 
two relays and two switches. The board is exactly the same. The software is exactly the same. Uh, the difference is just the price and the, that more components are populated. We also have a connection to the LED. And here we have the chip which we saw, so the LM358, the op amp which will filter and give a smooth reading from the antenna. We have a 4 MHz crystal clock to provide a clock, a stable clock for the receiver. Um, we need a stable external clock because we want to decode the signal very precisely. And then we have the external EEPROM, uh, 24LC266, and probably this is where they store all the code and verify if some someone is uh, allowed to use it. Uh, small notes, you can see that they don't uh, use you don't use the a proper I2C in that this clock line is actually not a pull-up. So it is driven by, by the chip itself, high and low, and the chip controls the clock line. Also, this line is not used as open controller from the chip, but we'll see later on. Um, interesting things is that we have two wire jumpers. So per default, they, are, they use a pull-up to, uh, to VCC. But using the wire jumper, you can set them to ground and probably this tells us that they use the exact same code on different boards or probably this is the way they tell if it's a one channel or two channel um, board so that the microcontrollers knows if there's only one switch or two switches. And that's basically it. Now uh, we have the board and we can read the signal and figure out how it's decoded. What we can also do, since it's single, a single-sided board, it's quite easy to remove the solder around the pick chip using solder wick, and then we can remove the pick chip and place a socket. So this way we can put back the original pick chip, but if we want to replace it with something we can reflash, we can remove the original pick chip and pick one, a pick 16F, which is reflashable. And since we sold it, so this is the original chip, since we, uh, we sold it, how about soldering directly some cables and be, rec uh, and be able to connect it to the logic analyzer, which is here, and to an oscilloscope to figure out what the signals are. Here, here is uh, so here we can find a look. This is the input voltage. Actually, it it says it requires 24 volts, but it can operate down to 17 volts. And here I provide, I think, 19 volts, and it still works quite fine. Here we have a logic analyzer that says CD Logic 7. Uh, this is the Peak microcontroller which I use to transmit my own code, and then um, these wires go to the microcontroller on the bottom and I can see the signal which is decoded by the op amp given to the microcontroller and the microcontroller then talks to the I2C chip to figure out if the code is already in there and this on the oscillator oscilloscope you will see the decoded signal which you could also see through the logic analyzer. Actually, the implementation was a bit broken, so my logic analyzer had a bit of issues to decode that, and this is why the oscilloscope caught quite handy because you can see um, how how the values are sent and so on. So here, already on this board, I already did the modification. But normally, it comes with this ordinary chip, chip directly soldered on the board. So what I did is I unsoldered. Um, on, remove the solder from the side, unsoldered the pick chip, I placed one socket like this, it's just a DIP18 socket and then I could either use the old chip again to analyze how the device works or I can put my own pick device, this is a pick 16 I have it this. So yeah, I, I use this one, so it's a PIC16 F1847, it's one of the top end, and this way I don't have to, to bother about 
the space cnc has 14k flash <coughs> also um, this bigger chip provides uh, uh, hardware I to see but I couldn't use it first because it's on the wrong pin and also because they don't use open collectors but they really do software big banging so I had to re-implement the whole receiving part uh, so the signal comes comes from here from this op amp um, decode, the, decode the signal um, you can also use the switch and the LED for debugging or for testing. Then I also re-implemented the whole I2C stack using software big banging between this chip and the microcontroller, which which wasn't too hard. And on the end, you can see I tapped on the voltage regulator so I can provide externally 5 volts instead of providing the 24 volts. Um, and actually, you don't have really to provide 24 volts. It goes down to 17 volts. Still, USB is a lot easier. And then here, I can tap on the chip so I can either reprogram it using my PICKIT2 programmer, or I can uh, connect a software analyzer, a logic analyzer, to listen uh, to the communication between this chip and the microcontroller and the I2C EEPROM. So I can figure out how they store the code or I can dump the code. So I implemented the firmware from scratch and how it now works is that I can reprogram using my pick kit, which is connected to the, to the right connector. This is the flashable microcontroller. And then we can use, instead of the 24 volts, we can stay, use the USB 5 volts. Whenever I plug it in, remove this. So, when I press on the button, you can see that the red LED blinks. So actually, this is more an indication status to, to know that the firmware works well, more debug, me, uh, more, so to debug. And then whenever I reuse the remote and I press the first time, you will see the LED stays on. So whenever there's a new code, the LED will go on and stay on, and the new code will be written to the EEPROM. If I press the button, I just clear the LED state, and whenever I press again, you will see the LED really briefly blinks, but it doesn't stay on again, because the microcontroller will verify if I already recorded the code, and if I did, it will just switch off the LED again. So whenever I receive a new code, it will always be stored in the in the EEPROM, and it always will be stored what? Since this is a 256 kilobits EEPROM, uh, we have quite a lot of space for, for, for code inside of them. We know that the codes only take three bytes. And if I want to reset the device, I just stay on the button for five seconds. So it will blink 10 times since, and then it stays on. Here you can see the LED staying on. And this goes through the whole I2C memory and just erases everything. So sets it to zero. We have to wait since uh, it's a bit slow. almost finished so now it's finished now we see it's cleared and if I press again on the remote you'll see the LED is on again so we've just cleared the memory also another feature is that whenever I provide source and whenever it boots up it will read all the codes and the, the purpose of that is that when I attach my logic analyzer here we just use the bus pirate in I2C sniffer mode then I can read I can sniff the whole traffic between the microcontroller and the ITC ROM and this way I can get all the codes out which are recorded in the in the memory and we'll have a look at this on the computer so now if we connect to the bus pirate here we can see we're in the bus pirate we select mode I2C um, setting the speed is not really important since it will read the, the clock pin and if we list all macros we have macro 2 which is sniffer so let's start the sniffer We'll plug in the receiver. Please plug in. And here you can see it starts reading the code. Since the first code is 000, which you can see here, it knows there's no further code because every code should start with the most significant bit of the first byte being a one. Now, let's sniff again and trigger the remote to see how it stores the code. Here, here we can see that 
it tries to read all codes again, but the first code is zero, and the first being the last one, um, it knows there's no further code. So it will store at the same exact address the code which we receive, which is this one. And then if we again sniff and press the button, here, you see it reads all the code, and it already found the, the, the right code at the first code, so it will not store it in, in any way. Up. It's now let's so I disconnected the receiver now we'll connect it again so I'll power it on again and here you can see it reads all the codes the first code um, is is present since we called it uh, from the last time and the second one there's nothing inside um, and this is why it stops to uh, to to read out then if we press for five seconds the clearing button, we will see that it writes all the memory with zeros, and this way it clears the code. So we'll wait a bit. It's a lot of memory, and my software bit banging implementation is not the fastest I implemented in, in C. Now it's finished. And if I power off and power on the device again, we can see the memory is cleared. So this way we have a receiver which we can power via USB or use any wall power to USB converter or a cigarette lighter and we can place the device wherever we want and just record the codes which are on there. Since it's targeted to exactly this frequency, the op amp is tuned to that, the antenna has the right size and is pretty long, um, the receiving range is actually quite high. So instead of having the two to five meters from the SDR, using this receiver, I can receive codes from up to 20 meters. So from far away, I could record any code which, ge which gets triggered. So here we have another receiver. This is the MDRU. It's very similar to the MDR and the main difference is that it uses uh, the main power socket to provide power and then you attach the relay on here to trigger the motor. If we look inside, the board out, we can see it's a mix between uh, through-hole components and on the other side surface mount, compo uh, surface mount components and I already have some indication which you see here. But the design is actually exactly the same, and even the layout is the same. They just change um, some wire jumpers to indicate that it's the other configuration or the other device form factor. But we have the relay, we have one switch, we have one LED. We cannot have two channels, it's only one channel. Then here we have the I2C memory, here we have the op amp, and here we have the timer crystal clock, this is the receiving part again, here we have the antenna, and this is the somehow voltage regulator, actually the voltage regulator is this one, and this is to transform mains to, to 5 volts, and here did some modification. Uh, and same at the other device, it uses a PIC 16 f 45 which is one time programmable, had code protection, so I own soldered this one, and I soldered my, my own chip on it, and uh, the same as the DIP version, it's a PIC 16 f 1847 uh, And I use the exact same same code. Um, I can detect if it's MDR, to, so the same code can detect if it's the MDR or the MDRU, and it works the exact the same way, so you press the button to, to clear the device or not. And I did a nice device, so it's the same, but here I don't really like working with mains, uh, and particularly on this one, it's not really isolated. They use the neutral pin as ground from uh, for the board. So don't try to probe with an oscillator or some unsolicited circuit, cause you will create a short. And this is why I uh, blew one of the fuses. I removed the voltage regulator. So this was a 1705 five volt voltage regulator. And now I also, on cable, I also can provide USB, um, and the mains is completely disconnected. But the firmware is exactly the same, and now I have three receivers which I can place a bit everywhere in the apartment complex, and um, listen and record the codes on here on, and 
on this programming and sniffing interface, I can just look at the ITC traffic, which is dumped whenever the power is, whenever the device is powered on. Now that we can record any code, we can leave the device just hanging around um, USB power source, and we can dump all the codes. We just pass all the dumped code. And so these are all codes with the bits, and I want to analyze and find out if there is some kind of pattern for this building. So we know that the first bit is always one, since it's the sync bit. We know the three last bits are the data bits, and as you can see, they're quite similar. But I wanted to find out if in the system code there is some kind of pattern telling if it's the same facility or if it's a different facility, and then the remote code. And this is why I show the, the distribution. Here and as we can see, actually there are some bits which come more frequent the others than others. These ones, and the one in the beginning. Obviously, we have 395 dumped code. So these one are in majority. Also, this one and this one. But else, it's it's quite random. Um, so this tells us that it's probably the they don't use um, any separation between the facility or that the system code is almost completely random. Another way to find out which bits in the code are really important and which one matters is just take one of the code which work, flash it on the device, and then press again and find out if it, if it still works since we have a flashable remote now. So this is what I did with this program and it simply changes the EEPROM um, and it uses you, so you provide the original code, it will flip the bits, and then you say, you just press the button, and if you're next to a gate, you just press the button, if, if the gate's open, you just press enter, so it says yes, the, the code works, else you just input any characters, and once this is finished, so you flip through all 23 codes, we'll just say yes, 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 it works, so it simply just changes the EEPROM value, flashes the EEPROM, which is quite fast fast on a remote control, and then you press the button and see if the garage door opens, or any other gate. Up, we'll just go through it. 18, 19. I only flipped the 23 last bits, since the first one is always one. And this is what we get in the end. Uh, we get a pattern, so we know that this code, uh, this, the first one has to be a one. The other one is not really important. And this is where the bit was flipped and I entered yes. So um, the code still worked. Since it still works, the code is not important. And this one is where I pressed one of the things to say no. With this bit flip, the code didn't work again. And you just take several of the codes. Up. Um, you just take several of the codes and you see the results, and here we can clearly see that the first bit is always a one, yes, but on all code, the four next bits are also not important, and in the end, the four bits or the two bits are also not important, and then it always worked with one zero in the end. So, the most important bits are these ones, and this is a lot less. So, here we eliminated five bits, here we eliminated four bits, this is... Uh, nine bits less for the actual information, for the actual bits which are relevant for opening the garage doors. What I also did is actually sniff the communication between the original software on the original PIC microcontroller and the ITC ROM, since I could switch all the time between my chip, PIC chip, which is my own code, and the original PIC chip with the original code. And I wanted to figure out how it stored the code. Um, you can only store 10 of the codes, and Let's assume this, thing, this is the code we send. How it works is actually it will go to this address, so it will take only four of the six byte, go to the address, and read what the value is. And then um, at this address, it's only one byte, and the byte is actually a mask. So the the value here, oh, the value which is here is one byte, but this is not directly what you will, what you will find here. See, it, they do it in a clever way, is that um, if there is a one here, it means that every one which ends with the value, with the value D, um, 
So this is how we explain exactly. So if there is a 1 in the byte which is read, the value d is allowed to be just 0. Only this code is authorized. If there is a 2, the value d should be a 2, and so on. And it's actually all the time an even number, and how, it, how they did it is actually a mask. So when the read, uh, when the byte which they read is 3, you have two bits enabled, and what it enables you is the 0 and the 2, which is authorized, so this is why it masks, and then whatever is in between is also authorized since it accepts uh, all uh, old number just trunked to the previous even number, and it only cares about even numbers. So this is quite clever. And also if you look at 7, we have three bits which are enabled here, and this way it enables 0, 2, and 4, the, the three first bits. This tells us that actually the value a is not really important, and this is what we've seen previously, that the fourth uh, bytes are not important. The value b, the first bit, is not important. This is also what we've seen before. And then we just use the seven other bits of the value b. c and d uh, are used in the address. Um, and actually it's f. f should be, this is, this is actually... This actually should be F. And F uh, stores the what they mean the data bit and it stores it at mask. So this gives us an indication how uh, which part of the code is important. The last thing I did is look again at this remote control. So if we open it, remember up, that this is the version with four buttons. Up, there's the battery on the back. So we have the phone buttons, and here we had a PIC 12C54, uh, which is again runtime programmable, and um, the, it had code protection enabled. So I did the same at the receiver. I desoldered the chip, up, and I put my own microcontroller on it. So it's, this is a reflashable one, it's again a high-end, so I don't have to bother about the, the code size. It's a PIC 12 F184, so it's refreshable. And the advantage of this remote over the other remote, which has a programming header, is that I can still flash it, connect it to the pin, but it has four buttons. And that's very useful. Um, the firmware is almost the same, so I just had to, to change which pin goes to where, that we have four switches. Source code is also available, um, so I reflashed it. But I have four functions on the different buttons. So this one is the normal button, which hands one code like the other remote did you just program one of the codes inside and then it transmits but then on the second button which is the red button it will send the second code and the second code could be anything else for example you could use the receiver to capture the code of the security card which are running around all the time um, once you sniff it you could program it on there and then if you cannot open a door with the normal code you could open the door with the security code. That's just a possibility. Or maybe you have two facilities. Um, then we have two other buttons. And the two other buttons uh, could be used, or in the code, are used to brute force. So if you press on this button, it will start sending randomly code. This is why it was important to figure out how the codes um, are, are accepted by the building. And using the tracer from before, we could eliminate nine bits from the 24 bits, so that leaves us with 15 bits, 15 bits is not too much to brute force, um, and so whenever you start pressing on the button, it will send 4 codes per second, and if one of the co um, and then you can stop here. What it also does is that when it stops, it stores the 6 last codes, so whenever you repress the button, it will retransmit the 6 last code. So the idea is that you start uh, brute forcing, and whenever you find the, the wrong code, the right code, you just press on the second button, which stops the brute forcing, um, stops draining the battery, and store the last value. And this way you could just go in a facility. Because this apartment complex have hundreds, maybe thousands of occupants, finding, uh, finding one matching code isn't probably too hard. But I didn't try it out since uh, using the receiver, you can just record any code and the idea is just to find out if the security works and if the if 
so I can reflash my code and if this was possible. Also, it's not really too interesting to flash the code or to have to clone this remote since whenever you go in the building, if you go to the garage door on one or one of the sides, you will always find a door which is open, which allows you to access to inside the building or which allows you to access to, to the garage door. So you really don't need one of these remotes and one of these brute force uh, to access the building. Um, it was more just to test what security it uses um, and so uh, as a hobby electronic project and it was quite fun.